Hello, and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg, and I'm going to stay on the other side of the camera today, because if you follow along, you know I had sinus surgery on the 18th of January, and I'm still recovering, still feeling pretty miserable. It is a long, slow, frankly disgusting process that we don't need to get into here, but I'm still recovering. The swelling has gotten a little bit better, but I just did, don't feel like showing my face right now. You could probably hear the congestion in my vo voice, so I figured I could do a Friday read since there is a lot of stuff to talk about here. And I would just let you see what I have been looking at this week. I've been mostly hanging out here on the couch with my little cozy Pendleton blanket and reading and staying out of the snow. Right today it's sunny which is nice, but um, yeah, finally, the weather's starting to kind of improve. It's gotten warm enough. So you won't see Teddy, he's not here. Joel took him out for a walk and an, an adventure because he's been a very good boy. He's been extremely patient. He has proven to be a wonderful caretaker, just like Joel, but he has been hanging out with me a lot of this week, just kind of sleeping on this end of the couch while I recover. There's one of his many rubber balls. That's actually a bone, uh, but those are his favorite things. We have a whole basket of them right there. And he just picks them up whenever he's feeling playful uh, and carries them pretty much everywhere. We also have his snuffle mat. We got that for him. So during this cold weather, we could try to keep him active. The problem is he is so good at that thing that he can get treats out of it within five minutes and he's done. <laughs> so it doesn't keep him all that busy, but at least it's something. Teddy returned from his adventure with Joel while I was editing. So I figure I'll just edit this footage in so you can say hello to him. Did you have fun? Did you have fun? He has been a very good boy and a good nurse all week, haven't you, Teddy? Haven't you? Such a good boy. He's been hanging out with me and taking good care of me. By the way, um, Guinness and Jamie, for those of you who have been around for a while, uh, live right there on the mantle right now. But there's your Teddy fix. Anyway, and just to finish off the um, layout before we talk about the books, yes. Joel and I did go to Italy. I know what you're thinking. And uh, this is our photo book from that trip. Gay and Away is a reference to the movie Under the Tuscan Sun. If you know, you know. And we love having this on the coffee table. This is our wedding album. We got married in Lake Moraine in Canada. The table's a mess right now, by the way. It's usually a little better organized than this. But anyway, we also have an Atlas, Joel's cookbook. Um, Last strawberry. These used to belong to Joel's mother, these little swans, and of course, and a cooking magazine. And I have tissues <laughs> and a pile of books. Some that I have read, some that I'm working on, some that are here just for show, and some that were options for up next. So um, that's kind of the update. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing this, to be honest with you. I just figured I'd give you an update since I do have a bunch of books that I have read. Uh, people have been very kind. <laughs> uh, everybody loved Joel's bookshelf tour. And I, I thought he did a great job. I, I would, so I'm glad everybody had a good time with that. That will be in the description box down below if you haven't checked it out. Uh, I also did a book haul. And uh, that will be down below if you need more. I have one more video that I had filmed ahead. And it will be coming on Monday after that. I need to start filming. So hopefully the swelling will continue going down. And I'll, I'll start feeling like showing my face. <laughs> <laughs> next week. Anyway, the uh, first thing I was going to talk about is not actually something that I read. It's just something that has been keeping me busy. And I happen to have a copy of the original book. So Airport by Arthur Haley. I went through a phase in my early 20s when I was obsessed with disaster movies. And I ordered a bunch of the books. And I, so I've never actually read this, but I have a copy of it. Look at that lovely little family photo. Arthur Haley is an international author in every sense. Well, isn't that lovely? <laughs> so I've never read it. But anyway, um, just for distraction, because I can't wear my glasses. It hurts. <laughs> uh, 
So, um, we've just been putting stuff on the TV that I don't really have to pay attention to or watch, and somehow we latched onto disaster movies. So, so far we have watched Airport, Airport 75, and last night we watched Airport 77, because uh, I have the box set of those movies. We wanted to watch The Towering Inferno, but it's uh, kind of expensive to rent. We might do it anyway. Um, but yeah, so in the Poseidon Adventure, I also have a copy of that book, but this is the one that I, I that we've, re the series we've really leaned into in movies, so I figured I would just show you the book, which I ordered when I was obsessed with those movies in my 20s, and, uh, I've never actually read it, so maybe at some point I should probably actually do that, but anyway, so that's been keeping me busy, and it has a book connection. The first book I read, uh, it's something I don't have anymore because it was due back at the library. So Joel kindly took Teddy on an adventure and returned it to the library for me. It's Morning and Evening by Jan Fosse. Jan Fosse won the Nobel Prize for Literature last year. And I had been a little hesitant about committing to the work that Jan Fosse is most known for, which is a three-volume work called Septology. It's called Septology. I think there, there are seven parts, but it was divided into three books, something like that. People get very uptight. Some people really want you to understand that it's intended to be read as one work. It's just spread out. Over. Some people call and consider it seven books. Some people only consider it three. I had the whole gamut of responses in my Nobel Prize reaction. Uh, however you want to define that work, I didn't feel like jumping into it. Morning and Evening is a teeny tiny little thing you could dunk it in your coffee uh it's like 107 pages and it starts on page four that felt a lot more manageable so i had actually started it before the surgery but i only got about 20 or 25 pages in and then after the surgery i needed like two days so i didn't pick anything up i instead um well, I, I didn't do anything. I just kind of slept and, you know, bled <laughs> for two days. But we, didn't, we don't need to get into the recovery because the recovery part is gross. Anyway, uh, so after two days, I picked it up and I finished it. I liked it. I will say I didn't love it. I definitely appreciate Jan Fosse as a writer. I think in my last Friday Reads before the surgery, I said that the writing was sort of mellifluous. It had a musical quality to it. And that is very true. But one of the things that gives it that sort of musical quality is this sense of repetition. And the repetition got old. And if something gets old in 107 pages, I think something is wrong. Because <laughs> if something is a, a really short work, I appreciate it being like concise and tight and all of that. And this felt a little rambly. It has a very dreamlike quality and the repetition does add to that. It feels like stream of conscious writing and I appreciated it, but I didn't love it. And it's supposed to begin with the day that a man named Johannes is born. And then it also has the last day that Johannes is alive. Um, it's just the so first day, last day, but the part, the first day is very much about his father and the, excitement that his father feels that he finally has a son and it doesn't feel like there's much of a connection between those two parts there's sort of passing references to the fact that Johannes and his father actually ended up having a very strained relationship but it never explores why it was a strained relationship or why this it would have been interesting to understand how the father is so excited to have a son in the beginning and where that relationship got strained but we don't get into that so i appreciated the book i liked it i did not love it and th that's going to be a theme <laughs> going forward so the next book that i read was float up sing down by laird hunt this was one of my most anticipated books of 2024 it is going to be released in February. It doesn't have an exact date. It just says February of 2024. I'll try to put it uh, in the description box. I'll have a link to the video about my most anticipated books in the description box down below as well. And if you want to know why this was one of my most anticipated books of 2024, the answer is right here. Zori, which was uh, Laird Hunt's previous book, another tiny little thing. It's a novella. It is stunning. It is gorgeous. I love it. I have talked about it a lot and recommended it many times and I will continue to do so. 
because I just absolutely love it. So I was really excited about Float Up, Sing Down. One, because Laird Hunt is an author that I have enjoyed. He also wrote a book called In the House in the Dark of the Woods that is a little more horror, which is a big de a departure for him. It was the first book of his I read, so I thought that was what he does, but it turns out what he does is much more kind of in line with Zori than it is with that. So this is a story collection set in the same town as Zori, and it has very direct Zori connections, and that was another thing that had gotten me really excited about it. Zori is sort of a peripheral character. I, I'll tell you, she never actually shows up, but she is mentioned a lot. She almost shows up a lot. It's almost like when you watch a TV show like Frasier, and you have Niles' wife and then ex-wife Maris, who almost shows up, but not quite. That's kind of at Zori in this story collection. So there are a couple of different stories. Each one is a person in the town. So you see Candy, Turner, Greg, Horace, Della, Toby, Lois, so on and so forth. Um, and what, hap it, what it turns out is that these are sort of linked stories, which I hadn't expected. They kind of directly lead into each other. Like Candy will mention uh, Turner and then Turner is the next story. Turner almost runs into someone in the street and then that's another story. So they very much link together. And some of the stories don't really finish and then you need to wait until you get the other perspective of the other person mentioned in it or something like that to sort of figure out what happens. I will say this ended up being a disappointment for me. I did like the first story in the collection, which is called Candy. I don't know why I feel like, I, I guess since you can't see my face, I feel like I need to <laughs> give you some kind of visual flair. So Candy, the first story, was really good. It showed some promise. And well, I, I would say Candy does not work on its own. It showed promise for the rest of the collection that I ultimately don't think it lived up to because Candy sort of deals with the idea that the, the people in this town, the relationships of the people in the town and the dynamics between them and how they can be helpful, loving, and beneficial, or they can be damaging and gossipy. And the sort of dynamic between them, that you have this community that can either build you up or tear you down. And I thought that was really interesting. And I thought that's what was being set up in the rest of the collection. That is not ultimately what happens. It just sort of feels like it's weird to say disconnected ideas because they are literally all connected, but it feels like ideas that don't ultimately add up to much of anything. Almost like Laird Hunt had a bunch of ideas for other characters and things that would be going on in the town while he was writing Zori and didn't know what to do with them or had to cut them out of Zori in order to keep this tight, concise pace that I really love in this book. And he had all of these ideas and characters and decided to just make them stories but they don't ultimately do anything or say anything beautiful or haunting. So this ended up being a disappointment for me. I am still looking forward to more from Laird Hunt. But again, I, I, I would say that this was a disappointment for me. Then I had this from the library. It's You can't see the title because of the sticker, but it's The Woman Who Killed the Fish by Clarice Lispector. Uh, ND, or sorry, Storybook ND is the, you can see right there, is the name of this series. So they have taken short works and uh, short stories in some cases and compiled them together to look like little golden books. And the idea behind it is to sort of give you that same sense of satisfaction and a little bit of nostalgia as well that you would get from the golden books with, the, you know, the feeling of sitting down and reading something in one sitting. So I had done one of these, The English Understand Wool by Helen DeWitt, and liked it. The only other book in the series that my library had access to was this one, and I have never read, or had never read Clarice Lispector before, so I thought it would be a good excuse. What I didn't know is that these are actually four stories that were intended for children, so it's not really what Clarice Lispector is known for, the contents. 
So you have the woman who killed the fish, the mystery of the thinking rabbit, almost true, and Laura's intimate life. So part of me just thinks I should have just not read this book. And there are illustrations for each story. Um, so part of me just thinks I should have not read this and just held out to read a regular Clarice Lispector book. So it's not what I was expecting at all. And I admit I did not enjoy it. I think part of it is that I didn't realize it was intended for children. <laughs> um, I also think it's not really clever enough. I don't know. I would not have enjoyed these stories as a child, and I don't enjoy them as an adult either. So it starts to feel a little bit like, what is, what's the point of this? And, you know, maybe someday I'll just try a regular Clarice Lispector book. But so this one was another disappointment. So at this point, I was, I was not feeling great. I had been on a spree of bad books, <laughs> or you know, middling. Me, I, bad books is not not fair. These aren't bad books, but disappointing reading experiences is what I will say. Between Morning and Evening, which ended up just being okay, Float Up, Sing Down, which was just okay, but which I had really expected great things from, and then an author I've heard great things from, but I just didn't get the... I, I didn't know that this was intended for children. So, uh, and at the same time, I was working on my audiobook, which was The Christmas Orphans Club by Becca Freeman, and I was really struggling. Audio, for whatever reason, has been very difficult this past week. I have not, I've had a lot more success with a print book, and I think because with everything going on, you know, the tissues, the recovery, I have to do sinus rinses every hour. I feel like opening a book it gives me focus. Listening, I'm too distracted and I can't really do it. And I will say, there was a bit of annoyance with the characters in this book. I was halfway through and I think I was really ready for the... The characters in the book are sort of emotionally stunted and that's kind of the point. They're supposed to get to a point where they move past that. But I was stuck in this loop where they just weren't moving forward and it was starting to get on my nerves. So ultimately, with the sense of disappointment from morning and evening and float up, sing down and this, and then the struggles I was having with audio and just frustration with the characters, and I know it would get better by the end, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to put the audio to the side and stop. Um, so this is a DNF for now. I'll probably come back to it. But like, I really needed a win. And... I didn't know what to do. I I thought about some things. Like I actually um, pulled out a Dorothy Sayers book. I had found Clouds of Witness, which is the second book in the Lord Peter Whimsey series. And I had read the first one last year, late last year. Um, so I thought maybe I'll give this a try. I, Cause I, maybe a mystery book will help like pull me out of this funk. And I, I really want to read, but I'm kind of frustrated by all of the things I am reading. I thought about Sue Grafton because she's sort of my comfort reading. And I, well, the only thing I did not want to do is go back in time and figure out where I had left off in my reread of the series. <laughs> and, you know, before I took the leap to do that or even actually pick, I went as far as picking up the Dorothy Sayers book from my shelf, but uh, I looked on the pile of library books that I had and I saw Leonard and Hungry Paul. And I thought to myself, you know, that's supposed to be a really sweet book. It's supposed to be about kindness. That's kind of my thing. So why don't I just try Leonard and Hungry Paul? I'm going to switch hands holding the camera. <laughs> so uh, I decided, why don't I just try Leonard and Hungry Paul? And we'll see how far I get. And I enjoyed it enough that it pulled me in. And I kept going. And I ended up finishing the book. So this is kind of a hard book to explain. It's about Leonard and Hungry Paul, obviously, but not too much actually happens in the book. There isn't really, there are plot arcs. I don't want to say that there aren't, but it's really a celebration of small things in life and relationships and appreciating what is going on around you which is nice and which is lovely. But if you are a plot focused reader, this might not be the book for you. If you need really deep characters, this might not be a book for you because, so here's an interesting thing. 
Unless I missed something, it never actually explains why Hungry Paul is called Hungry Paul. It just isn't important to the book. But you do wonder, why does everyone call him Hungry Paul? <laughs> so if you need explanations like that or deeper characters, it might not be for you. But you have Leonard and Hungry Paul, who are adults. They're in their 30s now. And they are friends they have very quiet lives. Leonard works for a company where he helps write encyclopedias for children and doesn't have much of a life outside of that. He sort of dreams of writing his own encyclopedia for children, but hasn't taken any moves to do that. And Hungry Paul is a kind of inaccessible character in that you don't ever really know. Well, he doesn't really want anything. He's just kind of someone who is in the moment, floating along, he still lives with his parents, doesn't really have a job. He works for the Postal Service uh, really just once a week on call. So he might not even work that week at all. His sister is getting married, and that is sort of as much plot as you get in this book. Well, Leonard meets a woman at work um, named Shelley. And so he kind of embarks on a relationship, and that's kind of the plot of the book. Hungry Paul and his family getting ready for his sister's wedding and the changes that the wedding is going to bring is kind of the plot of the book, but those things don't really matter. Really, again, it's just a book about the small things in life, small people in life who you might otherwise ignore. It's about quiet. It takes some interesting and odd turns toward the end. I liked it. I will say I didn't love it again, but it did sort of give me a bit of strength again to continue powering through some books. I had read it because Bob the Booker had talked about it. It was one of his favorite reads of last year and he got very emotional talking about it and how it t talks about kindness and I see all of that in the book but I will say I didn't have the strong reaction to it that he did. I think it's a good book. It is it is sort of reminiscent to me of The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle and books like that by Matt Cain that um, celebrate being yourself, connecting with people, finding community, things like that. But um, yeah, I liked it. I didn't love it, but it did definitely get me out of the sort of disappointment slump that I had been in. Um, and again, I'll get back to the Christmas Orphans Club, <laughs> probably. Uh, maybe in December again, since at this point we're well out of the Christmas season. But so that was the next book that I read. I have not finished anything else. I did had gotten Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano on audio from Libby. And I had been waiting to finish The Christmas Orphans Club before I started it. And it was taking so long that by the time I started Hello Beautiful, I only had four days left. So Maura Tierney actually reads the audio of this book, and she has been doing a great job. Uh, I'm trying to put this down without knocking everything over. Um, so I would heard really great things about Hello Beautiful, and I started it, and I was really enjoying it. Uh, I, I will say I'm not very far into it, and at this point, there are only two days left in the audio. So here's what I'm actually deciding. I am loving the audio because Maura Tierney is doing a great job reading it. But I am still being very slow with audio listening right now. And I'm just going to let that play out. So I am going to cash in a credit for the audiobook on Libro. And I'm going to continue reading it in that format. And I'll, I'll continue working on this because I am enjoying this and I do want to finish it. Um, I have not really started another book. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read. So I also have some books that from NetGalley that I have access to, and I just have not wanted to stare at a screen all week, but I think I'm going to pivot to that and read Neighbors by Diane Oliver, which is supposed to be released in February and which I'm really excited about. So it was another one of my most anticipated books. So hopefully I'll have a better reaction to that one than I did to float up sing down. So that's probably going to be my next book, but I have not started it yet. And then meanwhile, I have my sort of pile of possibilities here. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be doing it. I think Leonard and Hungry Paul served the purpose that this would have served. So I'm probably going to put Dorothy L. Sayers back on the shelf. And then I still have Prophet Song by Paul Lynch from the library. And Forbidden Notebook by Alba de Suspedes. 
translated by Ann Goldstein. So I just really have not been in the mood to read Prophet Song with recovery and, you know, general anxiety. I do still want to read Forbidden Notebook, but this is a short hold. It's only a 14 day. So I think I have one more week. So maybe this weekend, if I finish Neighbors and feel like diving in, I might give Prophet Song a try. If not, I'm probably just going to return it to the library and get back on the hold list and see how long it takes to get it again, because I, I just don't think I'm in the mood right now. Um, I do want to try to get this. This is on the same hold schedule. It's a 14 day loan, uh, but I think I'm much more likely to try to, to try to fit Forbidden Notebook in for whatever reason. So we'll see if I get to these two. They're the only two library books that I have left, although I do have one I need to pick up this weekend. And um, that is everything. Oh, disaster. <laughs> disaster, disaster. So that's what I read, how I'm doing and all of that stuff. Uh, I appreciate all the kind comments and people asking. Um, I am going to leave it at that. And hopefully next week you'll actually see my face in a video, but we'll see how all of that goes. Let me know what you've been reading, watching, loving, all of that in the comment section down below. Thank you for your patience. And as always, I will be back, and until then, happy reading.